Okay, modest clothing. So just to sort of complement, uh, you know, my recent announcement of you know having some clothing standards for our church, I just thought, um, you know, I'd teach on this topic, and it would be uh, very relevant to um, that recent announcement. Now, it's uh, interesting when you read in uh, you know First Timothy two, and we'll go back there as well. That you know when it talks about um, modest apparel, there's not really much in the Bible said about clothing. But it becomes a really big deal because, you know, it's very visual, right? Like your appearance, your hair, your, you know, whatever you wear, makeup, your clothing. Because it's very visual, it, it, it's, it's talked about a lot, it's debated a lot. There really isn't that much in the Bible about it. And really, um, if you think about modest, the word modest, it only appears in the Bible several times. One of it's here in 1 Peter 2.9, where it says, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness. So shamefacedness is just talking about, you know, you know, like women don't have shame these days to keep their nakedness covered, right? It's meant to be a shameful thing to reveal your nakedness, you know. That's why when, even when uh, they may need to operate on you, um, you know, usually the ambulance workers, you know, they'll put a towel over, you know, your breasts and over your crotch area because it's, uh, it's meant to be shameful. You, you're not meant to be revealing your nakedness just to anyone. Um, so that, that's alluding to the fact that, you know, women are meant to have a bit of shame in terms of just being too out with their body, right? Sobriety is seriousness, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. So we'll go through a bit of those in, more in depth in the sermon. <coughs> but one thing I always like to point out with this verse is, you know, the, this, this command <laughs> for modest apparel, it is directed at women, right? It's directed at women. Why? Because the assumption is that it's normally a feminine thing to be overly concerned about your appearance, you know, to dress up fancy, to not dress modestly. Unfortunately, we live in a day and age today where, you know, we kind of have to apply these principles to the men, you know, and it's like men need to, you know, need to be taught how to dress modestly because they're starting to wear the tight skinny jeans and wearing excess jewellery. You've got men's makeup now, men caring about, like, you know, having fancy hairdos and this cut and that cut. And, you know, it just shows you how far society is from God's word, that God's word, where it talks about the appearance, it's directed at females. Um, but today, you have very effeminate men, you know, the modern manliness trends and uh, all that. And I think a lot of that is, is quite effeminate, in my opinion. Now, generally people become known for their extravagance, don't they? But Christians are, are meant to be known for their moderation. See, if we go here to Philippians 4, 5, the Bible says here, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. So what does it mean like modest? Modest means it doesn't call attention to itself. It's not too extravagant. It's not, you know, like putting sackcloth on, you know, like the Bible says, where you're trying to draw attention to your mourning and things like that. So the, the general principle for a Christian's lifestyle, it should be moderation. There's a balance. You know, we're in the middle somewhere where we don't stand out so much in terms of our physical appearance. Right? Because what are we meant to be known for? We're not meant to be known for our physical wealth, our physical appearance and things like that. We're meant to be known by the principles that we have, right? the beliefs that we have. That is what is meant to stand out. And it's the same here when, it looks, when we go to 1 Timothy 2. See, what is meant to stand out? It's not meant to be the physical. It's meant to be the spiritual. But which becometh women professing godliness with good works. So you see our, our principles, our beliefs, our works is what is meant to make us zealous and meant to make us stand out. But when it comes to just living life, the way we dress, it's meant to be, hey, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand, right? Why, why does that tie into the Lord is at hand? Because the reminder is, is that we're not going to be here forever. Right? This world is not all there is. Jesus is going to return one day. It's going to be an afterlife. There's going to be an eternity. So that's why we're just meant to live just you know, a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. We're not here to live extravagant, you know, hedonistic, you know, pleasure-filled lives. Okay? So let's go into um, a couple of things today. So I've got three sections to this sermon. First of all, I just want to talk about convictions of the conscience. Now, I've preached a whole sermon on this, but I just want to go through this quite quickly. 
But this idea that there, you know, there isn't like just this defined standard in the Bible of what is acceptable dress and what isn't. You know, God doesn't say women wear, you know, these these pieces of clothing and men wear these pieces of clothing and you know make sure they are x centimeters from the knees or whatever you know make sure your hair is at least 20 centimeters long you know it doesn't give this level of detail to say this is how we should look this is how we should dress um because you know god doesn't want us all looking like robots right doesn't want us all looking the same there's a bit of liberty in jesus christ but we are given principles that we can go by but then you need to understand how these principles get applied, right? And that's why it's good to know uh, a bit about convictions of the conscience, how your conscience uh, interacts with your convictions, right? So your conscience is like the, the things that you know, the things that you believe. Your convictions is like how you apply God's word. And then the commandments are, are actually what God's word says. So what is a conviction? So a conviction is a belief held based on your knowledge and application of the principles in God's Word. Right? Let's go to Romans 14. Romans 14, this is uh, talking about doubtful disputations, which is, you know, these convictions that people hold to that are disputable, right? They're not, they're not sure. They can be full of doubt where they're not 100%. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. So this is another area where you say, well, is it, should Christians be vegetarians? Should they not be vegetarians? Is it okay to eat meat? Is it okay not to eat meat? This is things that people argue over. And this is an example that's used in the Bible to say, look, people can have their own views on what they believe is ideal because people, you know, people can make the case. They can say, you know what? Well, God, you know, in the Garden of Eden, what was his intention? That we didn't eat meat, right? And some people think that's what God intended, you know, and not meant to be meat is. Should just be vegetarians? You know, it's part of the curse, like eating meat. But it was God that allowed us to eat meat, right? And things like that. So people can make these arguments. But, you know, the Bible makes it very clear here that the one who does not believe he can eat all things is actually weak, weaker in the faith, right? For one that believeth he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. So this is how we should relate to one another when we have disagreements in these areas of convictions. Let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. So you see how verse 4 is, you know, it's talking about these doubtful disputations that ultimately people are decide between them and God, like what is the right thing to do, because it's not clearly stated, right? Unless there are other factors, and we'll talk about those soon. Verse 5. So another one is in regards to holidays. You know, some people think, you know, hey, we need to set a certain day where, you know, we worship the Lord and set it aside. They think, oh, you know, it's very important that we celebrate Christmas and Easter and holidays. But other people think, hey, it doesn't matter. It's all the same. Romans 14, 5. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. So this is not how just Christianity works in general, right? There are obviously things that are black and white in the Bible, those, those commandments. But how we apply the principles we see in God's Word, sometimes those can be a bit grey. And this is what this is referring to. When they are a bit grey, they're not clearly stated, we're given a principles, you know, people will apply them differently. And there needs to be some grace there, there needs to be some liberty. And you know, how do you decide what's right and wrong in those instances? Well, this is where your convictions come into play. Are you persuaded that it's right or not? So we go on in Romans 14, verse 14. It says here, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean in and of, it, and clean of itself. But look, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. So what is that saying here? You may not, you know, something may not be clear cut whether it's right or wrong. But it's saying here, if you believe that it's wrong, if you think it's unclean, then to you it is unclean, right? Even though nothing, nothing technically is clean, unclean in and of itself. If you don't think it's the right thing to do, then therefore it is not a right thing for you to do. You don't go against your conscience. You know, we use that same argument, you know, which is why th this is the argument we use for vaccines, right? To say, well, how can you have a religious exemption against vaccines? Well, because if somebody believes it's the wrong thing to do, for the, for the body that God has given them to take care of, then that, for Christians, that does become a religious thing, right? Because we don't want to sin against God. This is the basis, this conscience issue, 
This is the basis for conscientious objection. You know, like we, we used to have in our country, conscientious objection, but it's trying to, they're trying to make it secular, right? But, but the basis, it's based off this. It's based off, you know, if you believe something is wrong to do, you don't sin against your own conscience because that would actually be a sin for you. So that's where this idea of conscientious objection comes from. It's convictions of the conscience. Same idea. Romans 14, Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he allowed. Right? So he's saying it's good. If you, the things you allow you do, you're not condemned of your own convictions. He that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So what is it saying here? If you don't believe it's right to do and you do it anyway, it's sin. Right? If you, believe it's, if you believe it's the wrong thing to do, and you do it anyway, it's sin. That's what it's saying here. You eat not of faith. James 4 phrases it the other way. It says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Right? So it's not only a sin, left under that, not only a sin to know something is wrong to do and, and do it. Right? It's also a sin to, to know something is the right thing to do and not do it. Do you see there? So it's not sin. Doing the right thing is not just refraining from doing wrong. It's also refraining from doing right. Right? So, uh, uh, sorry, uh, sin is doing not refraining from doing wrong. Right? Or refraining from doing right. So it's, it's both ways. So the standard is a lot higher than people think. Okay, let's go to 1 Corinthians 10. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. What is he saying there in verse 23? He's saying, hey, just because it's not necessarily sin for me to do something, Expedient. What is it? Expedient. It doesn't necessarily is, is builds me up. It's good for me. It's good for others. So he's saying here, just because something is okay to do, meaning it's not sinful, that doesn't mean it's the it's the good thing to do, right? And this is where standards come into play because you say, well, you may set standards for your own life. You know what you're willing to accept, what you're not willing to accept. You know, you, you may base it on how it affects other people. You know, like, uh, like I have to try and set standards for this church as well. What, what I think is acceptable and how it affects others, right? Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. So we have other people in mind when we make our decisions. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that east, eat, asking no question for conscience sake. So saying when you go, what's the shambles? The shambles is like the street markets, right? It's like you go to the marketplace and, and you eat something, you don't really think about where it comes from, what's happened to it, right? Asking no question for conscience sake, your knowledge of where that food came from. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If any of them that bid, believe not, bid you to a feast, so now you're invited to a party, ye, and ye be, be, ye be disposed to go. So you go to a party of an unbeliever, right? Whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no question for conscience sake. So you don't really care where this food comes from. It's food, because it's, earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. But if any man say unto you, hey, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols, Eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So you can see there that he's using this example of food to say, look, there's nothing wrong with eating food offered to idols. Because idols, what is an idol? It's nothing. You know, it's not like it changes the food. There's no magic, magic there or anything. But what changes, whether it's right or wrong, it's the situation of how it affects somebody else. So he's saying, hey, but if an unbeliever is wants you to, is, it, you're eating this food and you're somewhat partaking in their false religion, then it's like, well, then you don't want to eat. It's not because it's, it's, it's like sin in and of itself to eat this food sacrificed under idols because now it's affecting the conscience of somebody else and your own conscience. You go, why am I participating in something that's wrong? For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So isn't it interesting that it's the same principle? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And in one way, how is it applied in one situation? Well, it doesn't matter like where this food comes from because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. In another situation, wait a second, this person is trying to worship an idol. That's, therefore, I'm not going to eat it in this situation. Why? Same principle. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So you can see here in this passage, the commandment or the principle, which is the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. But then you can see the application of that principle in different situations. That's the convictions based on the conscience. The conscience is not just this nebulous force. The conscience is your knowledge of what you know. Now that can be knowledge of God's word, that can be knowledge from experience and wisdom, that can be knowledge of what the other person believes, right? And what is right based on what you believe. So that's what the conscience is. Conscience is your knowledge, or it could be innate, it could be things you learn, right? And that affects your convictions, that changes what you believe is right and wrong. Now, this principle 
you need to use these principles to, to apply this to clothing. Right? So clothing, like I said, is not just, you know, I'm not trying to define what to wear. I'm trying to sort of veto some things that I don't want worn in church. But in terms of outside of those guidelines, you can wear whatever you, you like as long as you're in, within the guidelines of God's principles. You know, in church, so we got God is your authority in your life. You know, when you come to church, you have authority here. You know, work does the same. You know, you go to work, they have clothing policies, right? Why do they have that? Because they're trying to set a certain standard based on what they believe is either good for the business or based on what they believe is right or wrong. Okay, so I can't just define certain garments as immodest, right? Because there are different situations where some, something might be immodest to come to church with, but they may be fine in another scenario, right? And that's what this sermon is going to be about. So I'm going to talk about three types of immodest clothing, and then I'm going to talk about four sort of principles that you can use, like four factors that you can use to decide are they modest or immodest or appropriate or inappropriate in different situations. Okay? So let's talk about what immodest clothing. Different ways clothing can be immodest. We've got three ways here. Let's go to 1 Timothy 2 where we started. <coughs> In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good work. So the first way, we'll look at another passage first. So that's the one we've already looked at. This is the other passage that really is um, referring to uh, outward appearance and for women particularly in the passage, but obviously it can apply to men as well. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. So conversation in the King James Bible is lifestyle. So you don't want to read that as a lady and think, well, you know, if I just nag him, that's, it's going to, that's what's going to change him. No, it's uh, the comments, it's the lifestyle. So it's saying without the word, your actions are going to speak louder than words if you want to Im influence your husband. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, who's adorning. So chaste, if you think chast chastity is purity. So again, conversation is lifestyle. So it's like while they behold your lifestyle that is characterized by chastity, purity, coupled with fear, right? Well, with the fear of God, not a fear of man. Who's adorning, so how the way you dress, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on apparel. So this is where, where should the emphasis lie, right? But let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. So you see what an ornament is something you use to decorate something. It's on display. It's made to be seen. But what is meant to be an ornament of a meek and quiet spirit? It's meant to be the hidden man of the heart. So isn't that interesting that, that God uses that analogy of putting something on display? But what is on display? It's, on, it's the spiritual that's on display, not the physical. A meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. So what's one way you can dress immodestly? Okay, well, one way you can dress immodestly is you wear clothes that draw attention to themselves, right? They draw attention to the clothes themselves. Right, so in 1 Timothy 2, we see here that clothing is meant to be it, it, sobriety. What is sobriety? It means sober. There's a seriousness about the way you dress. Right, so like I said, I can't, I can't just, you know, decree, you know, what colors or what styles, like, you know, are, are, are sober, are modest. But some examples, in my opinion, would be, you know, people that maybe they dye their hair pink. Yeah, maybe they have like really fancy, like a mohawk maybe might be an you know, idea of something that's, you know, when people look at you, do they treat you seriously? You know, um, you know maybe your clothing, you know, some people's clothing is like really fancy and it's like, um, you know, it's just trying to draw attention to the clothing themselves. So that's what I think about when I think about immodest clothing when it comes to clothing that draws attention to themselves. Do people take you seriously? Is it appropriate for the occasion? You know, do you look silly? You know, when you, you know, it might be fashionable, you know, you know and, and that's what the Hollywood stars do. They may, they, they may wear clothes that are trying to draw attention to the clothes and to the designer. But is that how Christians are meant to dress? You know, our, we're meant to let our moderation be known unto all men. 
You know, we're not meant to come to church and feel like we're at a catwalk, right? So this is, uh, these are some principles that we apply to modest clothing. 1 Peter 3, well, the passage we read, look here, but let, that, let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. So the idea is, you know, for women especially, you know, our attitude and our spirit is meant to be that we are, they are meek and quiet, right? So you're not meant to be the loudest person in the room, you know, as a, as a female, right? And it should be the same in the way you dress, right? If you dress and you're like the loud, like, you know, you're the one that everyone notices, it's the loudest costume in the room, you know, people say like, oh, it's a very loud t-shirt, right? So they use these terminology because, you know, your clothing can be very loud as well. But I think if your spirit is meant to be meek and quiet, the outward should be showing that same sort of attitude as well, that same sort of principle as well. So you know, it's like if you go to a funeral and somebody's just wearing really bright colours. It's out of place, right? So you need to sort of use some wisdom. Over-the-top colours, over-the-top accessories, jewellery, hats, things like that. So you can have immodest clothing that draws attention to itself. Then you can have clothing that draws attention to your wealth, right? First Timothy 2, it talks about broidered hair, gold or pearls or costly array. You know, you have like, like the singers that wear, you know, they talk about the bling that they wear, all the, the, the rings and the jewellery and the earrings and the necklaces, the, the expensive clothing, expensive handbags, expensive shoes, all those sorts of things. You know, we're meant to be wearing clothing that just brings attention to our wealth. Why has it got broidered hair there? Well, because, you know, it's amazing how much women spend on their hair. You know, they spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars in colouring it, recolouring it, you know, perming it, straightening it, perming it again. They get bored, they straighten it again. And each time it's like hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Like, you know, even back in the day, it was probably even more expensive, you know, where, you know, people would be spending money on very, very fancy hairdos and things like that. So it draws attention to your wealth with broidered hair. It requires a lot of time and money. Um, and look, you know, when it comes to quality, you know, I'm all for quality, right? Like when it comes to buying things. But there's a difference between buying quality and buying something just for the brand name. Just for the brand name to, and you don't get any benefit from it. But like I said, everyone's going to have different opinions on, on, you know, whether they're buying it for quality or not. So the idea is not to, you know, use these principles and then judge somebody else's intention. The idea of this sermon is that you reflect on your own intentions, right? And you reflect on, you know, are you doing things for the right reasons? And, and, and can you apply these principles in your life and set a good example? First Peter 3, we see it mentioning plating the hair, wearing of gold, right? And putting on of apparel. Obviously, that's just not putting on clothes in general. It's, you know, we compare this to 1 Timothy 2. It's referring to the costly array, right? The expensive clothing. Right, so you know, sometimes hand, like handbags, I think is a good example, where you know a bag is a bag, right? But you know, if you get an expensive bag, like some of these branded bags, might cost you like two thousand dollars for like a branded bag, whereas like you know, a thirty dollar bag might do the exact same thing. So we need to weigh up these things. Um, you know, shoes is another example, where sometimes you know you can get. Like, I mean, my shoes are pretty expensive. They're not branded, right? But they're, they're functional. But some people, they just buy like $500 shoes, $1,000 shoes, and it's just the brand. It's not actually anything practical about it. Okay? So what should be the emphasis? Like I talk about, what should be the emphasis? And I, I mentioned this when we talked about 1 Peter 3. It's the inward, right? So it's not the outward that should be the emphasis in the Christian life. It's the inward, an ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. Look at this, which is in the sight of God of great price. See, so our, our emphasis and where we should put our energy is not into doling up the outward appearance in the sight of men, right? But it's our inward man so that we look, you know, beautiful in the eyes of God, beautiful, spiritual, right? Okay, what's the last one? What's, a, what's another way you can wear modest clothing? Well, the last one is probably the most obvious one, is clothing that draws attention to your body. Clothing that draws attention to your body. Now, obviously, this is something that is, is applies more to women than more to, to men, but it can apply to men as well, right? Like, you know, it's, you know men, men, you know, they're really muscular, they're wearing tight clothing and things like that. You know, some women struggle with that too. So we don't want that sort of environment amongst 
Christian, amongst, you know, in church and amongst Christian communities, right? Look at what it says here in Proverbs 7, 9. In the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night, and behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot. The attire of a harlot and a subtle heart, and, and subtle of heart. So we see here that, what is a harlot? A harlot is a prostitute. They dress in a way to showcase their body because that's, how, that's how what they're advertising, right? That's what they're trying to draw, draw men with. So you, as a lady, you don't want to dress in a way where you, where you were to put you next to a prostitute, you would look the same, right? That's when you say, well, how do I know I'm dressed in with your attire and heart? Because if you look at a prostitute, and nowadays, like, sometimes prostitutes are dressed more modestly than girls are dressed. You know, Christian girls are dressed. And some girls think like, you know, just because, you know, you go to the beach, just because you go to, you know, you have a wedding or you have like, your, you know, year 12 formal, that it's okay to just like dress like a prostitute. You know, we need to make sure women understand, no, it's not okay to dress like a prostitute, you know, and there are ways that you can celebrate and you can, you know, doll yourself up without looking like a prostitute. So how do you, how do, you do that? What's the difference? Well, I believe the difference is when you have the attire of a harlot, you're trying to showcase your body, right? You're trying to draw attention to your body, draw eyes to your body, right? Whereas, you know, you may be doled up, but it doesn't draw attention to your body. It's better to dress in a way that directs attention to your face because that's what you communicate with. That's what you want people looking at, you know, as opposed to clothing that draws attention to your body. First Timothy 2, we talked about shamefacedness. You know, people need to be, have some shame over revealing too much of their body. It's something that is meant to be shameful. It's not necessarily sinful in all circumstances, right? Because there are situations where you may need to reveal your nakedness, right? Like, you know, it's like when you undergo surgery, or somebody needs to help you, you're in trouble, you know, or other reasons, you know? <clears throat> not necessarily sinful, but it's something that people should be ashamed of, and we don't want to just show the whole world. First Peter 3, we saw, while they behold your chase conversation coupled with fear. You know, sometimes uh, Christian girls will dress, like I said, in their attire of an harlot. You know, they dress in very immodest clothing. And you say, like, yeah, but they're, they're still a virgin. They're not sleeping around. But when you see a picture of them, do they look like somebody that doesn't sleep around? Right? So it's like, while well, they behold your chaste conversation, like somebody should be able to look at a picture of a Christian girl and think, this, per this person is a pure person. Right? And they don't think, you know, don't ask the question, you know, well, they're a Christian girl. They say they're a virgin, but... You know, you know, well, are they going to stay a virgin for long? Sometimes I think about that when I see like young girls, you know, and they, they dress the way they dress and the way they act, and you think, well, maybe they're a virgin now. They're going to be a virgin for long if they, if they keep behaving and keep hanging around the people they do. It's not a good thing, right? And they can ruin their life, you know, and they get pregnant and it's just a terrible situation, right? It's not, not a good situation to be in. So dress in a way, this is a good tip, dress in a way to direct attention to your face because this is what you use to communicate with people. So what are some examples? You know, we talked about some of mini skirts, skin tight clothing, um, you know, low cut shirts, front and at the back, high cut skirts. You say, well, the skirt's really long, but if the cut goes all the way up to your hips, you know, that's, that's not very modest, you know, and hiding your body. Um, the other thing as well is the, the, pat the patterns on clothing the lines on clothing, you know, like, you, you know, the world is all about the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. So sometimes it's not always easy to find modest clothing, but sometimes you go and you say, well, it's all covered up, but then the, sometimes the lines on the clothing are there to draw attention to your buttocks or to your breasts and things like that. So to keep that in mind too, you don't want clothing that draws attention to your body. Okay, you want to be dressed as modestly as possible. And like I said, I always thought a good piece of wisdom was what stands out when you dress. Is it your face or is it your body? And if it's your body, then maybe you need to do a bit of work on that, right? Okay, so that's three ways that you can dress immodestly, right? It's either draws attention to the clothing itself, your wealth, or your body. Now let's talk about four factors that can affect the situation, right, and make these things right or wrong. So there's a few things to keep in mind. Ways to dress modestly and different scenarios, right, or factors. 
So one scenario is, or one factor that can affect your conscience of whether what you decide is modest or not for that situation, is the authority over you. Right now, this is a bit more black and white for the person deciding whether or not they can wear that because the decision is kind of somebody else's. Right? So what do I mean by authority? Well, Ephesians 5 says here, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Right? So it's commanded in the Bible that wives should submit to their husbands. So one example is if your husband says you're not wearing that, and you say, well, I want to wear this, I'm going to wear it anyway, you're actually in sin. Why? You may think it's modest, but if your husband, your authority over in your life says no, and you do that anyway, then you're in sin, right? Because you're going against the authority in your life. It's the same with children and parents. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. So if parents go, no, that skirt is too short, and you keep wearing it anyway, that's, that's wrong, right? Because children have to obey their parents, okay? Another one is in the church and in your workplace. You know, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. So like I talked about today, you know, so we can set rules for the church. And it's a, you know, it's a test for church members. You know, will you abide by the rules that are set in the context of church? So you can see the authority in your life can set rules and it can you know, make them right or wrong, whether you believe they're right or wrong or not. Whether you believe they're modest or not, if there is authority in your life, you need to submit to that authority. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. For they watch for your souls as they that must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief. For that is unprofitable for you. So what this verse is talking about, it's referring to the followers to say, look, you, you should follow with a certain attitude because it's actually better for you if you submit to the authority, the God-ordained authority in your life, whether it's your parents, your husband, or whether a church authority and government authority to a certain extent. Okay, so that is one way, um, you know, one factor that can affect the conscience to say, well, is this the right thing to wear or not? Authority can change whether or not something is right to wear. Are you permitted to wear it? Another thing to consider is, Hey, would your authority figure consider the garment to be immodest? So you may not go, well, I haven't you know, had an express command from them not to wear this particular outfit. You know, they said I couldn't wear this particular one. But this new one that I bought, well, they haven't said no to that one yet. Yeah, but you might think, yeah, but if they saw it, would they approve of it? And that might affect your conscience. You go, you know what, you know, I know them enough that you know, they would not approve of this either. So I'm not even going to buy it. I even have it. I didn't waste the money. Okay? So, authority. Number two, another factor that can affect your conscience is the motive. Right? Your motive. Because you know your own heart. You know, you know, why are you wearing this thing? Are you wearing this to draw attention to yourself? Are you wearing this for the wrong reasons? If you know already that it's the wrong reason, it's already a sin. Right? Nobody needs to tell you it's wrong. You know, if you know in your own heart, and this is where your conscience can convict you, because it's like you know your own heart, you know you're doing it for the wrong reasons, and your and your conviction, you know, your, your conscience is going to convict you, make you feel guilty, because you know you're doing what's what you believe is wrong. Matthew 23. See, like, look at how you know God is concerned, you know, with the outside. You say, is God only concerned with the inside? No, he's concerned with the outside too. Look at what it says here in Matthew 23:25. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you may clean the outside of the cup <coughs> and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Right? So it's not just about cleaning the outside and having a bad inward. Right? So you, you don't want to go, well, okay, well, I'll just comply and I'll just wear it, but inside you don't want to do the right thing. Obviously, it's more important that the inside is you know, doing the right thing than the outside, but you want both. Now, blind Pharisee, verse 26, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter. Look at this. That the outside of them may be clean also. So we don't have this attitude that only the inward counts and not the outward. We don't want the attitude that only, oh, we'll just comply with the outward, but the inward is rebellious. The attitude is we want the inward, which will then lead the outward, right? So that we clean up the inside, the outside may be clean also. So God is concerned about the outward appearance. He's not only concerned about the heart, but we want the heart to drive what happens on the outward. 
Mark 7, and he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetous, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. So it's, it's important that you have a pure heart that, to start from a pure intention so that it comes out on the outside. Look at what it says here, Matthew 22, verse 37. Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So you see the first and greatest commandment is to consider what God thinks. The second is to consider how it affects your neighbor. So if somebody has the attitude of, well, I just don't care what anyone thinks. It's my clothing, you know, my body, my choice, right? Now, I, I, I understand that, you know, you have the right to your own body and that you have autonomy and things like that. And we're talking about what's morally right, what's spiritually right, and how you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. There should be in the equation of how you decide what to wear is how it impacts, you know, how am I representing God? What does God think of what I wear? And how is it going to impact others? Right? So it's, this is, it's, it's the attitude of I don't care what anyone thinks, I believe is indirect contradiction to these two commands right look at what romans 14 says let us not therefore judge one another anymore but judge this rather so saying let's not our focus be on judging others right but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way so you see how the emphasis is not about what are other people wearing. The emphasis should be, am I wearing something that's pleasing to God, that's not going to put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Right? And this principle can be applied with many things, but when it comes to clothing, I think it's more applicable to women. And you know, women have to think about, hey, how is, does it affect others? Right? How is it going to affect the, the environment that we're in, the church environment? Okay? So we need to consider the weaknesses of our brothers in christ right hebrews 10 says let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works right so we're thinking about one another we're considering how it affects other people all right third one two more situation the situation is going to change hey guys just keep in mind when you walk in and out of that door just don't let it slam right people walk in and out you know i know you may need to go to the car you may need to do something you know, you can see that the, the, the door does not have like a soft closing thing on it. So you're walking in and out, it's quite distracting. So just, just keep that in mind, guys, when you're walking in and out, that you don't let the door slam, okay? The situation, all right? 1 Timothy 2. For kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Now, why am I coming to this first? Now, we read in 1 Peter 3, it says here, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, that they may also be one, uh, they, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Now, these passages in 1 Timothy 2 and 1 Peter 3, they mention certain like gold, pearls, costly array, things like that. Now, what I don't believe this is teaching is that those things are always wrong to wear. You know, what I believe these passages are teaching is that the emphasis and your lifestyle should not be characterized by immodest clothing, by these things. It should, should be characterized by the inward. Because there are certain situations where it's okay to wear extravagant things, right? So this is why when I, when I talk about here in 1 Timothy 2, it says that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. That doesn't mean there's never a time for war. There's never a time for fighting. There's never a time for contention, right? Because there are times for that. But overall, what should characterize the Christian life? It should be a life of peace and godliness, right? So it's the same when it comes to our clothing. It should be characterized by godliness, chastity, modesty, you know, not, you know moderation, things like that. Because what are some instances, you know, where it's sometimes okay to, to wear, you know, um, what, what would normally be immodest clothes, would be suitable. Well, think about when you go to like a fancy dress party. When you go to a fancy dress party, people are there, you know, the point of it is, the point of that party is to, you know, wear something to the theme or whatever. So you're not necessarily being immodest. 
going to a fancy dress party and, and wearing something that draws attention to the clothes in that particular situation because that's what the situation calls for. So you see how the situation can change what is modest or what is not modest. You know, people go to protests, right? You might wear something, you know, you can't, you're trying to draw attention to yourself, right? That's the purpose of it. So in those instances, they might be a bit different. You know, maybe you're doing marketing for a business. You know, you're doing marketing for a business, you're in a public area, you're trying to draw it, that's the point of it, right? In those instances, you say, well, that's not immodest, that's sort of suitable for the occasion, isn't it? Another one is weddings, and we see this in the Bible. Weddings, you know, is, is, is a time for people to sometimes wear more expensive clothing, to be, wear jewellery, to be, put on makeup, to be adorned with things. Isaiah 61 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments. So even the groom would wear ornaments. You know, sometimes when you dress, they might wear different things, nice cufflinks, put a, put a rose on, things like that. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with with jewels. So we not only see this in the Old Testament, we see this in the New Testament as well in Revelation. It says, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. Look at this. Prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So we see that God expects, even at a wedding, that a bride is adorned to a certain degree. Right? And we'll, we'll maybe wearing a fancy dress, maybe wearing jewellery. So you can see that it's not ruling these out completely. So saying our lifestyle should be characterized by modesty, right? Some, what are some other scenarios? Maybe in competitive sport. You know, some people will say, oh, you know, like, you know, don't get women into competitive sport because there's no, like some Christians will have that stance. Like women can't do any sort of competitive sport because they're going to be dressed immodestly. Now, are they dressed immodestly? If you wear like your spandex and your tight clothes to church, well, that's why I think the situation it is immodest at church, right? But if you're like a professional cycler, or if you're a professional wrestler or something, you're a prof and you know, you're wearing tight clothing, I mean, there's a, there's a purpose for that. And in that situation, I don't think it's necessarily immodest. Now, are there some sports where they unnecessarily dress immodest? You know, and it's like, I think it was like, uh, what was it, the, um, the, the beach volleyball. You know, they wanted all the girls to wear like bikinis and some of the girls protested and they're like, oh, we can't wear the bikinis, we just want to wear the short shorts. And I was just like, gosh, like, what's the difference? You know? But, you know, there's some, there's some where they, they know there's that draw card or you know, maybe more people will watch it if they dress like that. And it's not actually for the, for the sport. So you don't necessarily need to dress like that just because everyone in the sports dress like that. But if there's a practical reason, like if you're a swimmer, Obviously, you're going to be wearing something form-fitting. You're not going to be wearing like a polo shirt and denim skirt, right, to go swimming. So there, there's a situation that's going to change, you know, whether things are modest or immodest. You know, so something you might wear to the beach. Maybe you may be wearing a little, you know, like shorts, you know, tighter things to go swimming. But, you know, I still don't think, you know, like just because you make underwear out of a different material, that doesn't mean it's okay to walk around in your underwear. And some girls think it's okay, you know, because I'm at the beach, they can just take all my clothes, I'm just wearing a bikini and a little bra. I, just, I still think that is way immodest. And there are plenty of things you can wear to the beach where you can enjoy the beach, but you are more covered and you are more modest. Okay? Now, the last one I want to talk about, it's not too much, is the perception. The perception. And we talked a bit about that in 1 Peter 2, when we talked about, or 1 Peter 3, we talked about chase conversation. You know, what is the perception when you wear your clothes? Are you in the attire of an harlot? Do you look chaste and pure? Are you trying to look chaste and pure? What is the appearance, right? Look at what 1, Timothy, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 says. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Now, does that mean that the perception, like, uh, does that mean then that other people's perception just controls how we dress? Because women will say, oh gosh, if I, if I had to dress according to the lusts of men, I'd have to, I'd have to dress like a Muslim, right? I'd have to wear the, the, the full-on tent and nobody can see anything. Nobody can see anything, right? Now, that's not the case, right? So the, the, the point I'm making here is, you know, when you're not bound by other people's pitfalls, 
But what you want to consider is, have you considered other people's people? Does it, does it even come into the equation of when you consider what to wear, it's like, look, am I making this unnecessarily difficult for me? Right? Am, I, am I encouraging you? You know, you say, well, maybe I'm older or maybe my body's not that firm or whatever. You might say, well, but am I encouraging the younger generation to wear the wrong things? You say like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm older. Nobody's looking at me. Yeah, but you know, your, your daughters are going to follow the things you dress. And should they be wearing that thing? Are they going to make men struggle to have a pure mind when they come to church, when they go to work, when they go about their lives? What's the appearance? So, how do, you, how do you judge by perception? Sometimes it's good to get the opinions of others. You know, this is why it's good. If you're not sure whether something is modest, ask somebody. You, know, you can ask your dad, ask men in your life to say, hey, do you think this is something that would draw attention to the wrong parts of my body? That I'm sure any, any man would be able to you know, give you a good judgment to say, you know, look, that's, that's a little too revealing. You know, that's, a, that's making my eyes go to the wrong places, right? Proverbs 1.5, look at what it says here. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. Sometimes when you get other people's opinions, it can help you formulate your own opinions, right? And I think it's good for women to get opinions from men. Because women, you know, women and men, they think differently. Their eyes are drawn to different things. We have different lusts, right? So women, you don't want to go, yeah, well, I don't see any problem with that. You may not see a problem with that. But ask the men in your life, and they will... I'm sure they'll point out very quickly whether there's a problem or not. Proverbs 11:14, Where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. So again, like I said, this is not about saying other people dictate how you dress. Right? It's about do you consider how you look. Right? This is not talking about, oh, the majority is going to decide what's acceptable. Right? It's just, do you get some opinions of wise counselors. It's not just a majority opinion. It's if you talk to a bunch of wise people that may be more spiritual, more mature in the faith, if they're sort of saying the same things, that's probably a good indication that the, that the standard of modesty is where they're saying, right? Because they, they have wisdom, they have thoughts on these things, okay? So get the opinions of godly men around you that love you, and if unsure, if you're unsure. And uh, you know, don't just put yourself on display. Um, you know, don't just ask your friends. You know, don't you know how people they'll take a picture of themselves in the bathroom and then they'll post it on Facebook and on TikTok. What do you guys think? You know, is this modest? Obviously, that's a silly thing to do, right? And it's just people do that these days. We we need to make sure. Just make sure you're not like this. Make sure your kids are not like this. Gosh, this 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 social media just posting the selfies of like you know, very immodest pictures, like that needs to stop, especially amongst Christians, okay? So, in conclusion, let's just go through here. Modest clothing, draw attention to the clothing itself, the wealth, the body. What are some conscience factors? Are you allowed to? Authority. What is your motive? Is your heart? You know whether you're doing things for the right reasons or not. Is the, situ is the situation called for it? Is, it? is it modest in the situation you're going to? Right? And the perception. How are you perceived by others? And like I said, it's not, we're not controlled by other people's perceptions, but is it, is it, are these part of your consideration when you decide how to dress? Okay? And the last verse I want to share with you is this, because this, this is the ultimate principle. 1 Corinthians 10. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Because whilst we talk about what other people think and what I think and what you think, always remember, you know, what's most important is what God thinks. You know, like when you, when you get dressed and when you leave your house in the morning, you know, when you go to work or, you know, wherever you're going, you're going to the beach, you're going to a party, don't think about, you know, would Victor approve of this? And you know, what would other people at church think about all this? You know what we should be focused on? Is God pleased with me? And if God looks down from heaven and sees the way I dress, sees the way I talk, sees the way I have my hair or the amount of jewellery I have on, would he be pleased in the situation that I'm going to? You know, I think if you, if you have that at the forefront of your mind, that's a good start. And then we have these other factors that can help you decide, you know, what's right in all these different scenarios. Remember, whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. All right, let's pray. 
Thank you, Lord, for your word. I pray, Lord, that you help us, set us with the right heart. Lord, that we want to do what pleases you, not just pleases man. But Lord, as we consider what makes you pleased, Lord, we'll also consider how our actions and our appearance affects others. So we thank you, Lord, and uh, we thank you for your word, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.